The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development, with a platform and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives. At The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self, and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. Paul Connolly. So in and out of trouble from a very young age, Paul's life has taken more turns than most could handle. He's gone from abandoned in a children's home to best-selling author. When Paul Connolly was just two weeks old, his mother put him with the rubbish, and one of his neighbours heard him crying and rang the police. They got him and they took him to social services. Then at the age of eight, he was moved to St. Leonard's Children's Home in Tower Hamlets, and it was a life, it was a life-changing move, but for all the wrong reasons. From the principal down, the home was run by a paedophile ring. And from then on, Paul's childhood and schooling was filled with violence and mental torture. With no real schooling and no positive male role models, Paul gained a reputation as a violent schoolboy, which at least protected him from the attentions of potential abusers. When he was nine, he joined a boxing club. And here he finally found a group of men that took him, trained him and fed him. This was one of the first interviews I did. And the reason I do these inspiring people is because I always think that there's someone else worse than we are. And when I read his book, which is the title, obviously, Against All Odds, is, is a great title, uh, I wanted to know more. And when I heard his story and the challenges he's gone through and how he's managed to change his life around was obviously something that I knew would definitely be inspiring, inspiring to many people. So... Um, I think it's a great interview. He has a great story and uh, well done, Paul. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, and welcome to Inspiring People. Today we're here with Paul Connolly, who is a hugely successful celebrity personal trainer, an author, and an inspiration to many. Hi, Paul. How are you? Hi. Nice to, meet, nice nice to have to you meet here. You, Bernardo. How are you? Okay. I'm good, thanks. Yeah, it's great to be here. Great to... Uh, tell me a little bit about your early days. Uh, early days. I was the last of eight children, Irish Catholic family. Um, back in the day, well, you know, the Catholic religion not going to be used. They, you know, don't want to use contraception, so used to have hundreds of children that they had. And uh, I was the seventh boy and the eighth child. And I was born in East London in Stratford, Queen Mary's Hospital. My mother had some sort of breakdown. I think it was sort of, you know, at the end of her tether. So she actually put me out with the rubbish. She actually put put me out at two weeks old with the rubbish. Apparently one of the neighbours heard me crying and called the, the police or, and they, was, they come and got me and I was taken in by social services. I then was brought up by nuns in a convent, a children's home convent in uh, North London, Hendon, in Mill Hill till I was seven um, by nurses and nuns effectively. By the, um, That was, uh, yeah, till I was seven. When you get to a certain age in this children, in that children's home, you have to move to sort of like the big boys' children's home, which was uh, a London borough, Tower Hamlet's children's home in East London. <clears throat> this children's home was called St Leonard's, and effectively it was run by a, a pedophile ring, by a pedophile ring. The, 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 it, this was back in the late 60s, early 70s, when child protection was pretty much non-existent for you know in social services where these these people who work with children and wasn't even weren't even vetted there was no such thing as um you know vetting people who worked in care and like doormen are attracted to gyms paedophiles are attracted to working with children this particular children's home held 300 children right. and it was run effectively by uh from the principal down a, a, a paedophile ring of um of about four or five um mainly male members of staff. My house father was uh, recently just got 14 years at the Old Bailey for a series of buggeries, child abuse, you name it. What they didn't, what they didn't do wasn't worth, wasn't worth talking about. Myself, I was one of the lucky ones because when I went to this children's home, I was just before my eighth birthday and I was considered to be um, older for these people. Um, <coughs> the dormitory I grew up in of eight boys... I'm my, myself and another fellow, the only two survivors. They all committed suicide in one way or another. My best friend jumped on a railway track at Marlin Station, killed himself. 
these children were abused from very, very young ages, from as young as three and four years old, sexually, mentally, physically, you know, you name it. Um, it was uh, it was quite a tough. I had quite a tough upbringing. I mean, I slept with a knife under my pillow from the age of eight years old, and I was considered to be a violent child, which was you know, effectively one of my saviours because yeah. they went for the weaker children. So, as you can imagine, I did suffer some quite a lot of violence and quite a lot of mental torture as a child, and obviously that affects you as you grow up. Being told I was, you know. One, you know, an Irish scumbag, going to be ending up in prison like all my brothers, and you know, because all my brothers had gone through that same system. Um, what was your school life like? Non-existent. I didn't go to school because I was the the uh, kid from the children's home with the cheap uniform on, the free dinner ticket, and um, I had a target on my back. I was horrendously bullied. We were starved as children. The people that brought us up, they stole the the budget for the food, so we lived basically on bread and butter. So I was tiny. I was a tiny child bullied, abused, and if I went to school, I effectively got bullied or caned, so I just didn't go. So I was expelled at the age of 14, and I worked on a fruit and veg stall in Rockford Market from the age of 14, started work at 14. So is that when you started your, your own life, basically, on your own, on your full time? Uh, not, <coughs> not, not effectively, no. I, I started boxing at the age of about uh, nine or ten, and that was basically when I when I started to sort of have outside interest from the children's home I was in. We used to walk past this particular boxing club in East London, me and my friend, the one who killed himself. And one day we went in there and the men in there, we thought, you know, they're going to tell us, that, you know, fuck off or whatever. And effectively they, they took us in, their wives fed us, they trained us. And they, these were the first sort of serious male male role models that I I found weren't trying to bugger me or beat me up. So I got into boxing. I was I'd done very well as a schoolboy champion, and my my career was going to be a professional fighter. Did you Did you have anybody that inspired you then? I mean, yeah, you... Muhammad Ali was my inspiration as a child. Yeah, I used to look up to him. That was my era. So anybody that stood out that helped you when you were a kid when you started boxing? Yeah, the coaches, the boxing coaches. They were they were real. You know, they were proper men who their wives used to bring food up and feed us, and they you know they took us under their wing. So yeah, these people were. You know, effectively, my first real proper male role models that were decent people. And uh, I thrived at boxing. I became, like I said, I became a schoolboy champion. How old were you then? Uh, 15. 15. Yeah. And you started working uh, I was, at I was, 14? I was working f- at the age of 14, yeah. Do you remember what you got paid then? Or? Um, not exactly, but it was, you know, it was a pretty much a pittance. It was, I was just working on a fruit and veg store at 14 years old and... Um, I didn't have enough to live on. I knew that because I was still in care. I was officially still in in council care. Uh, I left. We were we had to leave at sixteen, so then I had to have enough to live on. So then I was started to do building work as well as a fruit and veg store just to be able to pay my rent in my in the, my first bed sit. And then you pro- you became a professional uh, boxer at the age of eighteen. No, I had contracts to become a professional boxer at the age of eighteen. But then I had a severe accident, which basically, you know, you have turning points in your life. I've had a few things that have happened to me that really changed your life around. And you have a, uh, this was the first one. I um, was help. I was doing a roofing job, and I fell down off a roof, and I severed almost severed my arm off and severed my hand in half. And I had a terrible. Act. I was dead on arrival at hospital. I bled to death, and they they saved me obviously, and. Um, that was effectively the end of my the end of my boxing career. I just signed contracts to be a professional fighter. It was the era of Nigel Benn and all that, and boxing was very very popular. And effectively, that ended my career, in, um, which left me in a little bit of a pickle because I couldn't read or write. I was totally illiterate, and I was twenty two years old. I was, I, I was. What happened was I had three or four years where I was being in rehab to try and rehab my body and I decided that I was really interested in the body. It, it sort of changed my attitude to what I wanted to do and I got very interested in the body, in rehabilitation, in working out and, in, and those kind of things and this was what led me into a fitness career. The doctors at the time said I wouldn't be able to do a physical career and I needed to study for a, st- a sedentary job but me being me, I just ignored them and thought, no, this is not what I want to do. I want to get involved in the fitness world. The problem was I couldn't read or write, so I had to go to night school. Three years, three to How four years. How old were you then? I was, this is, by this time, I'd, I was hitting my early 20s. 
and I had three, four years of night school just to learn the basics, reading and writing and arithmetic, that kind of thing, basic computer skills, and uh, really struggled with it. But then, you know, because the problem I had with it was that most of the people in my in the class I was in, without being rude, were special needs type people. And the teachers used to talk to me like that. Hello, Paul. How are you today? <laughs> you know? And there's, you know, you know, you know, there's a difference between not being educated and and being stupid. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And uh, I found them quite patronising. But you know, I made it. I managed to. I managed to learn to read and write. I, I studied for my first gym instructor qualification. I then basically. Um, got a personal training qualification. I was the first personal trainer in the City of London in 1988. I went out and uh, I was asked by Pickwick Pictures to make the body video of Elmer McPherson. And I made the, the pilot for the body video of Mel, Elmer McPherson. Then I was asked to go out to the States and I started training celebrities and went from strength to strength. I know I've sort of skimmed over a few years then. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, uh, if we go back a bit, when you, when you win and you obviously got you overcame your injuries and everything else. Mm. You started working in nightclubs and tell me a little bit about that part of your life because obviously yeah. that's, well, it, it's a very important part of your life. Yeah, I was. I became a ducker and diver, really. I, I, I was mini cabin, I was on the doors, I was I was running gymnasiums, I was working on fruit and vegetables, I was, you know, I was basically doing anything I could to make money. But what happened was the door work became very lucrative and I was involved with without going into too much detail with a lot of quite a few naughty people and there's a lot of money around then in the 80s and 90s it was a rave culture and we were doing security all over the place so because i was involved with gymnasiums all the time in the old days all the all the doormen used to be you know you'd meet in gyms and you know it was just a natural progression that you know people from gyms tend to be doormen <laughs> so I ended up as a doorman for 15 years throughout mainly the east end of London, some parts of the west end of London, and, you know, working in some really heavy-duty places where, you know, you've got to be able to handle yourself. It was really quite naughty. I ended up uh, looking after brothels, mining hookers in the east end and west end for, you know, and then uh, uh, it, was, it was it was strange, really, because at one end we were, you could be in, you know, an east end brothel looking after young ladies who were selling their bodies for a living and and the lowest forms of life were coming through the door. And then the next day you could be in the West End, close protection through for, you know, a corporate client who was at the top end of the scale. So, you know, it was it was a lot of variety in that work. And you 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 had to be able to behave yourself with the with the you know, with the people that mm-hmm. I think that's why I was I was chose to a lot of the time I was chose to work with with corporate clients because I, I knew how to talk to people and a lot of the guys I worked with didn't know how to talk to people, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it, was, it was quite a lot of variety in that work. So that was obviously kind of, was, I think you had a turning point then yeah. when obviously it started getting, you started getting busier or, you know, and yeah, things I, started getting a little bit more intense. Yeah, a lot of the guys I've worked with are dead now. They've been Irish, they've, you know, three of the guys I worked with have been shot dead on the door, drugs, all of those kind of things. I had myself particularly. I had two two quite serious incidences. I was attacked by five guys in a in a club in Essex, and it was a case of I was brought up by old school doorman, like not the doorman of today. We're talking about heavyweight boxing champions, people from East End, proper East End. I don't want to mention too many names because obviously, yeah, don't you? yeah. I was brought up by people who I was groomed as a proper doorman. Some and. You know, my, my one of my mentors was a British heavyweight champion. He's dead now. He's a guy called Ronnie Redruff, and he said he always used to say to me, "It's better if it really comes on top. It's better to be carried by. So it's better to be tried by twelve than carried by six. Mm. And I remember being surrounded by these five guys, and effectively they was they were going to kill me. They were going to jump all over my head. So I knew I had to hurt to I hurt two of them quite badly. Just to, it was self defence. Unfortunately. The police arrested me on a G on grievous bodily harm and grievous bodily harm with intent. Now, they, now the intent charge carries a minimum of five years if convicted. I had to wait a year and a half to go to Crown Court, and all I could hear was the people who brought me up in children's home saying to me, "You're a low life Irish scumbag. You're, you're the only place you're going to end up in is prison." So this was this self fulfilling prophecy be coming true. You see. I could hear their voices in my head saying, and, you know, so on one hand, here I am training celebrities and being a successful personal trainer. On the other hand, I'm looking at a prison sentence and I'm dealing with the lowest form of life. 
So, it, it, I, you know, it was a real... You were doing both things at the same time. At the same time, yeah. yeah. It was almost like you a double... Like, yeah, double life. Double life, yeah. yeah. It was almost like a double life. And um, How old were you then? I was then in my early 30s by then. Um, yeah, and it was it, it, one of the most frightening things that ever happened to me, standing in front of a jury coming in, waiting for the guilty or not guilty after a, a, a week in Crown Court. Your legs go to jelly and you're thinking... And they say a smiling jury never convicts. And my jury came in smiling, but I was so there was an 80% chance of my conviction because I'd broken one guy's jaw and I took the other guy's teeth out of his head. I had to do that. I had to show extreme violence because they were prepared to jump on my head, which they were trying to do anyway. And it was five against one. The judge summed up, and in the judge summing up, he said, if this was a normal man who was in front of me, there's no way in a million years he'd be standing in on these charges because he was attacked by five men. So he's already told the jury that I'd acted in self-defence. The problem was, had I used excessive force? And the jury actually actually came back and said, you know, self-defence, reasonable force. And my legs just went from underneath me. I was so stressed. I mean, you're looking at my life would never have been the same if I'd have gone to prison. I could never have done anything, you know. You had a family? At the time, I didn't, no. no. At the time, I didn't, but I wouldn't have a family now. I've got, mm. obviously, I've got two two young boys now. Mm. I, would, I would never have a family now course, if I'd yeah. have gone to prison. Um, I wouldn't have had the career I've got now, and I certainly wouldn't have been as successful as I am right now. Um, so, you know, that was another pivotal turning point in my life because, you know, if the jury would have convicted me, my life would never have been, I would have gone the other way without a doubt. If you're interested in working with me, contributing to the magazine, maybe speaking at any of our many events around the world, partnering or licensing The Best You, go to www.thebestyou.co. So it's fascinating. It was obviously, as you said, you had a kind of a double life whereby mm. you were doing what you were doing and then on the other half you were working with celebrities and, mm. and doing DVDs and yeah. travelling the world and working. So explain me that part of, of Well, the your problem life. was that at the time, although it looked very successful what I was doing, it wasn't paying much money. And I was somebody who was ambitious and I was somebody who wanted to, to buy my own property. I wanted my own house. I wanted, I wanted some security. I'm, t- I'm a kid from who literally had left care with a suitcase with a couple of T-shirts in it and, and a pair of shorts and, you know, basically nothing. I own nothing. I left the, the care system with the clothes on my back, you know, and that's a massive, you know, from the age of four or five years old, I knew I was alone in the world and you're massively insecure about that. There's no, there's no support system for me whatsoever. And if you, if you realise that from a baby almost a baby you are on your own there is nobody mm. got your back in this world mm. that's a sobering fault from a such a young age mm. and that changes you as a child it makes you very angry it makes you very hard yeah. yeah and so it also made me ambitious I was going to own my own house I was going to and I bought my own house but it, I suppose that's the good thing about you Paul that at that time even if you were making money and you know you were you had that side of your life you also were looking at what was positive and what ideally mm. you wanted to be. You were already a personal trainer, yeah. you studied, you learned how to read. Now, tell me about that side. How did you get, okay, you became a personal trainer, but how did that take you then to producing DVDs? And Well, I was, I was always someone, uh, one of my, it's funny, they say your strengths are your weaknesses, don't they? I mean, I'm, I'm very good with people, always have been. I knew that was my strength. I love people and I, and I knew that I was good with people. So I wanted to be in a people business and I was obsessed about fitness because fitness has actually kept me sane. You know, because, you know, you know, when you've got lots of mental issues, obviously if you can physically fit and physically strong, that can help you mentally as well. So I was one of those people where I was just so determined to do well for myself that I actually was too intense. I was one of those people that was far too intense. Everything was about moving on and moving on. And I always had this thing that all I need to do is get through this bit and I'm going to be okay. I always had this eternal optimism, which God knows where that came from in my background. I should have been, you know, a very pessimistic person. But I've always felt that, I mean, rightly or wrongly, that I was someone special and I was meant for better things. God knows why, because most people I grew up with would be exactly the opposite. Okay, so we went. You, you went through that part of life where you had that double life, yeah, and you became a personal trainer, and um, and then you you started obviously working with celebrities and stuff. I'm, yeah. I'm interested in how did I make that bridge? Yeah, yeah. How, how did you make that bridge, and how did you take it from becoming a personal trainer mm. to end up doing all sorts of things? 
Okay, so some of it's luck, some of it's judgment, like most things in life. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I was the first personal trainer in City of London back in '88. Now, what happened there was, I, when I first passed my first gym instructor qualification, I applied to the Barbican in the city, and so did 200 other people. And I, God knows why, and they gave me the job, gym uh, free weights manager, straight in, bang. But I could barely read or write at the time, and they actually wanted me to run the gym, and I literally was struggling with the paperwork. So um, after having a chat with the management, which was an American company at the time I owned that, they said, right, obviously your strengths are on the gym floor. The first, the first, the start of it was that I was approached by Pickwick Pictures because of my boxing background. They wanted to make a, a, the, the video, the body with Elmer McPherson, and they basically said, "Would you come and fly out and help us make the pilot?" And would that, you know, would you be interested in that? And that just seemed to platform me. Once I'd done that and it done well, it's still one of the best-selling videos out on the market now, twenty years later. I I became sought after by corporate people, by you know, by people who wanted me to train them, and effectively, I. I, I, Chris, I trained Christopher Reeves. When I was in the city, I was training quite a lot of well-known people. And I think half the battle was, was you know, if you can train someone, you can give them a good workout and you're likeable, you're effectively going to you're gonna be popular. I was credited with being the guy who brought the boxing-type workout to this country because I worked in the States for quite a few years and I was bringing back techniques from America to London that people in London hadn't seen. And I started the Box Aerobics because I had a boxing background and a fitness background. I set up my own company, Box Aerobics, and I was running courses, training trainers. And effectively, I was started. I was the only trainer in London that was demanding fifty percent of the door of all the classes he did. They they weren't paying me a wage. I was taking. I'd started a business where I was taking percentages, and you know, because I was in such demand, I was able to make those demands on these clubs. I just seemed to go from strength to strength in, in the actual fitness industry. And what what motivated you then? I mean, how did you how did you motivate yourself to to become what you wanted to be? Uh, I think once once I started doing quite a bit of television, I was on the Big Breakfast for a week um, as a fitness expert. I, I didn't truly believe in myself until I started having the sort of success that I was having, and and, and people were saying, you know, people people kept telling me, "My God, that's an amazing class. You really know your stuff," you know. And eventually, it's like anything. If someone keeps telling you you're rubbish, eventually you believe it. If you get keep getting told you're amazing, eventually you start believing that as well. Yeah, of course. But yeah. um, you know, so I mean, I didn't. I was one of those people. I always worked harder than everybody else because I didn't really believe in myself. And I just seemed to have this turning point around my mid thirties where I thought, you know what, I am really good at what I do. Because you know, most people, I think even people who've had normal upbringings, they think they're blagging it all the time. They don't genuinely believe in themselves. But all of a sudden I had this, uh, uh, you know, this turning point where I thought, you know what, I really do know what I'm doing and, and I'm really doing a good job and everybody seems to love what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I started running courses where I was making sort of 10 grand a week just hiring a venue and, and training other trainers, which allowed me to then come back and buy my first house for cash and, you know, and you just think once you start getting that kind of success, it becomes a your drive just in, becomes more, doesn't it? You want more. You want how, how old were you then? That was around my mid thirties. Mid thirties. Yeah, I bought my first yeah, fifty grand bank. Just bought my first house, and I was away then. You know, so. And um, did you have any inspiration? Anybody that inspired you then? I have a good friend who's the guy who just found me just now. This this guy it's funny because the people around you are paramount, I think, to, to anyone's success and to anyone's influence, especially growing up. And I've just been very lucky. I, I've I've met people along the way who just as big a pain in the ass as I am have stood by me. And I am a pain in the ass, by the way. And they've stood by me through thick and thin. People who cause they can see through the veneer, you know. This guy who just rang me, Ian, he's he's now he's um He's a director at Virgin Media. He's a very influential guy. He was, it, but the total opposite to me, very well educated, university, all those things. He's been my best friend for 20 years now. And when I was going to – I mean, I've missed a very pivotal point, actually. There was a point where – I've sort of got, got to go backwards here. The police came to my house just after I got out off of that GB8. So two police women kept coming and knocking on my door, and I wouldn't answer the door. They kept coming about a week now I'd had a lot of history with the police, and they know they knew me very well. And I, eventually, I realised they're not coming to nick me; they want something. So, they're two attractive police women. So, I opened the door. Paul Connolly, pre- previously of St Leonard's Children's Home, yes, thirty-five years old, just bought my own house, just got offered the GBH and the GBH. May we come in? We've got some terrible news. 
uh, no, you can tell me on the doorstep because I was never friendly with the police, or even <laughs> though they were hot. You know, well, we really need to come in because it's you know it's, it's, it's there's an Operation Mapperson going on. Apparently, all the children growing up in your dormitory are dead, apart from you and Maxwell. Maxwell's doing a double life sentence. Now, I didn't know that at that point. They'd all committed suicide. Now, what happened is, years later, like most of these things, the police had become involved in a child abuse case, but we're talking about 15, 20 years later. So your life's already kind of in yeah. balance, yeah. And, so and this is knocking on your door. They're knocking on my door, and they start turning this all over again. Now, this, is, this was another pivotal point in my life. This is another turning point in my life because after they'd interviewed me and I found out what had happened in greater detail, I became very angry because Liam Carroll was my best friend growing up and I just found out there and then that he'd jumped on the railway track at Marlin Station and killed himself. And they said he was a schizophrenic, but that's a very convenient label as far as I'm concerned. That, you know, he was a, to me, he was one of the strongest people I ever met. And for him to do that, he must have been in horrendous torment. But he was abused from a very young age. Obviously, this all comes out afterwards, doesn't it? I mean, at the time when we were kids, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was happening to him. Didn't talk about it? No, no. So, anyway, there was a massive court case and a, and a class action, a civil class action. The court case, what happened was the police had cocked it up and three members of staff walked away, almost got free, 18 months on remand, walked away time served my house father got 14 years now at that time I was still involved with the naughty people I went and got myself a gun and I was going to kill all three of them in one day now I had this dilemma right this is exactly what was happening I was just becoming very successful and at the same time there was no one left to 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 gain to go and get vengeance so now it's like what do I do so if I hadn't have had this friend, Ian, this guy who I was just talking to you about, I wouldn't be here now either because I would have killed them, all three of them. If I hadn't, he paid for me to see a shrink and this shrink has effectively talked me out of it. But it was very, very close. I'd followed three of them. One lived in Essex, two lived in East London. They were, these were three paedophiles who only served 18 months for six people's deaths. Okay, and we're talking about abusing hundreds of kids over 30 years, six people deaths that I know of, there would have been lots more, and they'd only served 18 months in prison, No, only one significant prison sentence. So I got myself a Browning handgun, 10 bullets in a clip, one in a barrel, and they were going to get it all in, the, in one day. I was going to, because it was, it was it, to me, it was my responsibility. I was the only one left. Now, this is the dilemma. I'm coming up for 35 years old. I've just signed contracts to train some celebrities who I can't mention because I've got confidentiality agreements. We're talking about A-list celebrities in LA. We're talking about serious people. I just signed contracts to go out there for three years and train these people. And I've got, if I kill these people, my life's over. So what do I do? So I get the gun, I go into London, I, there was two of them in a the pub, I know I could kill two of them in one day. I'm standing with my back to a guy called Alan Prescott. Alan Prescott was the principal of the children's home who repeatedly buggered young boys for years and years and years. I took, the, I took the safety off the gun, cocked the gun, had it down by my side, I turned around and I looked around, sitting at the table was two women and they saw the gun, they saw me, and this woman, the tears welled up in her eyes and the fear in her face. I'd, for, if I hadn't have seen her, for some reason I just got this moment of sanity. And he didn't even know I was there. I had my back to him. I'd literally turned around to put the gun on the back of his head and pull the trigger. And as I caught this woman's eyes, you know, like just for that split second in time, this woman looked at me as if to say, please don't do this. And I don't know. I must have had a shred of decency in me or something, but I didn't do it. I quickly clocked the back, the gun back up, st stuck it back in my jacket and quickly walked out of the pub. So I went home, put the gun in my own mouth, knocked my front teeth out. <laughs> These are false. <laughs> <laughs> Bleeding, cocked the hammer. I've got this, the easy thing now is to just, I can't live with the guilt of not doing anything about this. So now I'm going to kill my own, myself. I had a cat called Sausage. Now, this sounds weird, but this cat jumped on 
on me and was purring and nuzzling and dribbling in my ear while I had this gun in my mouth. My face, when I knocked my teeth out, I was bleeding, I was crying. The, the cat just started to snuggle up to me while I had the gun in my mouth. And again, didn't do it. Took a, drove, in, drove up to the East End through the gun in the, in the Thames. Now, if it wasn't for The Shrink, the film that, that called The Sleepers and my friend Ian, I would have done it, and probably that woman, I would have done it. Again, defining moments. Now, if I'd have done it, again, I wouldn't be here. I'd still be in prison. I'd be in prison for you know, a long, long time. But again, that was because I had people around me who were saying to me, you're going to end your life. And then what kind of revenge is that? That's no revenge. Your life is over. Your, your revenge should be to go on and have, and, and have a happy family and to be a successful man and prove these people wrong. Well, you've already proven to many people that they were wrong because you were very successful at what you did. And now they're the ones that are in prison, like not all of them, unfortunately. And so my revenge was the book. Hmm. If you're interested in watching the video content of this interview and many others, or interested in learning from world leaders and teachers, go to www.thebestyou.online. When did you decide you wanted to write the book? I wrote the book, I decided I wanted to write the book um, probably about five or six years ago now, but it's, it's, it was published in 2010. It's been out for, coming up for two years now, just over two years. So that was your drive. Your drive yeah. then, you decided, okay, I haven't done this. You got the help, you got the support from yeah. your friends. You were very successful at what you did. Obviously, that helped you as well. Yeah. People told you you were good. And then you said, okay, well, I'm, I've got to put this on paper. I've got to write the book. Yeah. 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 Now, being someone who can barely read or write, that's not an easy thing to do. But I used to go, you know, all my successful clients would go out to dinner parties and I'd be telling stories like, and they'd be sitting there with their mouths open and everyone would be going, why don't you write a book, you know? So I always knew I had to write a book. And also, my major driving force now was to write, get a positive revenge, write the book, and basically put in this book what people don't believe. People don't believe goes on, and what these people have done, and, and, and to basically out them. Now, the problem is, if you're not convicted of these crimes, you can't use their names. I've used the names of the, con- the people that have been convicted, but I haven't managed to, I can't use the names of the people that weren't convicted. And also, you can never write the real book. So I wrote the real book. Some serious people would be around my house. (laughs) And uh, I'd endanger my own life and my family's life. Also, people that are not convicted can get the book taken off the shelf because they haven't been convicted. Also, some of the things I've done, I would be in prison because the police would be around my house as well. So as I've done a lot of things in my life that I'm not particularly proud of, and the book is quite honest about those things. You must have gone through a, a healing and, process. Yeah. But I, I suppose to, you must yeah. have had loads of different emotions yeah. while you were writing the book, but I suppose it, it healed you in a way. The book was very cathartic, but I was having nightmares and I had to move into a friend's house because I was frightening my kids waking up screaming in the night and stuff. So I had to move out of my own house when I was writing the book and live in, and move in with a friend because I was having real problems with it. Um, because you go through lots of phases in your life. I mean, I was an angry young man. I mean, I'm 50 now, and and I could still, you know, I, I still I could still feel that anger. And you, I don't think I think once you're damaged, you're damaged. I think you learn how to live with it, and you learn and you and you try to look at the positives. People, you know, there's lots of um, stories that aren't there about yeah, the way your mindset affects the rest of your life and the way you think. That there's one that I love about the two brothers, the one the one whose father was a drug dealer and a wrong one, and then he basically went he went to prison. And one of the brothers was very successful. The other brothers followed in the father's footsteps was a wrong one. And they asked both brothers why they ended up the way they ended up. So the first one who went to prison said, well, what do you expect with a father like mine? The second one who was really successful, not just successful business-wise, but successful family man, same as me, become a very level-headed guy, he said... When they asked him the same question, what do you expect with a father like mine? Because mm-hmm. exactly. yeah, it's mindset. Everything's about mindset, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You, know, you, either, you either believe in yourself or you don't, and you can't fake that. You know, well, that's the problem. And aspirations as children, if, when you damage a child, you, you're effectively not allowing them to believe in themselves. And that has to come later for them. I've done everything late in my life. I was still single, nearly 40 years old. But it's that influence, I suppose, that you have, obviously, when you grow up, you know, mm. the influence you have with either people giving you positive, you know, messages mm. or, or people making your life misery, mm. you know, and it's how you take that information and what you do with it. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. So um, 
fascinating book, and you've done extremely well with it. I mean, how many books? How many, how many have you sold? It sold uh, on the i on the iPlayer on the Kindle. It sold one hundred and twenty thousand copies so far. It's uh, it was a bestseller at the beginning of the year. It outsold all the big books like uh, Lady with Dragon Tattoo. It's become the first bestseller, the very first bestseller on the Kindle. Uh, the paperback's done very well, selling out of WH Smith's for about 20,000, something like that. 20, and it's really done well. It's, and considering I'm an unknown, as the book is just really, really done no, well. No, you're yeah. extremely well. You should be really proud. So you got a book deal straight away, did you? Yeah, got a book deal straight away. Went to John Blake's and uh, they snapped it up straight away. Absolutely. First, first publishers we approached. Well, you must be really proud. I, mean, I know I've said that several times now. What what drives you now? Because I know you're very passionate mm. about many, many things, but mm. you know what drives you as an individual? And I know we, we'll talk about education later yeah. and stuff, but what drives you as an individual? My family, basically. I've got two young kids, and I want them to be proud of me. Well, so, yeah, yeah. Simple as that. How old are they? My youngest is only three, Archie, and my oldest is eight. Two boys, Harley and Archie. Lovely. Mm. Now... Again, we'll, we'll talk about what do you think the problems of society is now in general? I think I work, I mean, you know, I try to give back now. And I work with a, a guy called uh, the Earl of Listerwell, Francis Listerwell, Lord Listerwell. Now, this man is the cross-party chairman for child protection throughout the UK. And he, and he helps children leaving care. That's one of his primary functions. Now, I work with him as an advisor. I also work with Sweet Science, which is a boxing charity. We go into schools teaching kids to box. And I also raise money for the volunteer reading help, which are they, they mentor young children that get left behind in school, they, the kids that don't have mentors that teach them to read and write. Now, I feel that the problem we've got is that the resources are, are not used in the right way with regards to, to the kids that get left behind. You know, I mean, the problem is we are under-resourced. Every, every, it's always about money. Mm. No matter what way you look at it, it's always about money. But when you... What I never understand is the billions of pounds that kids who end up like these feral kids on the street causing problems, gangs, gang fighting, stabbing, all that, that could be so easily stamped out with early interventions and with utilising finances with these kids and mentoring schemes. There's never enough of that about, never in a million years. And it's costing the prison service, you know, 80% of people in the prison service can't read or write. 80% of people, in, sorry, not in the prison service, in prison, can't read or write. They're illiterate, 80%. I mean, that's not... That's a big that's number. That's massive. Mm. That, you know, I work with um, a, guy, a lady called Sue Porto, and, she's, and she basically... There's a, a, the VRH, the Volunteer Reading Help, and they, they are passionate about just having an education, being able to read and write, having someone believe in you, having a... Have, if, if you've got an aspiration... You're never going to have aspirations in life if you don't believe in yourself. You're never going to believe in yourself if somebody doesn't believe in you. Yeah, exactly. Now, I understand the teachers do a magnificent job, and it can't be easy. And, and you know, they're cutting left, right, and centre. But I think there's so many people like yourself and or like myself who were involved in, in, you know, in trying to make a difference, who are willing to spend our time and, and mm. our, er our energy in any kind of way that we can actually go in. And that's what I think. I think schools and the education system needs more exemplars, you know, yeah. more people that they can learn from. I recently gave a speech in the House of Lords. Drop me names again. <laughs> I gave a speech in the House of Lords a couple of weeks ago and there was women in the audience crying when I was giving this speech because the problem with, with, with people that are privileged, and I'm not having a go at privileged people, is they do not, they live in ivory towers. They don't realise what really goes on in the world. And like you're saying, people like yourself, people like me, there are so many people out like us who are willing to give back who, who are, we are so underutilised. Absolutely. And we can only do so much as individuals. But if we were, if we were brought together as a, as a corporate type entity with some kind of backing, can you imagine the good you could do? Can you imagine just, it's not just about money then, it's about your knowledge, your experience, your mentoring. It's about you actually really caring. And when you really care, those kids know that. And when you've come from where they come from, they respect you straight away. It, it, Immediately, I think the thing is that you know education has changed so much. I mean, the, the world is changing mm. at such a speed. Technology, everything's changing, yeah. and I don't think it's necessarily adapting with the times. No, it's not. And all they've got to do is just invite people to come in. And I suppose they've got all these controls and everything, but that's what needs to happen, doesn't it? We have the best education system in the world in this mm. country. Mm. 
if you can afford to pay. Mm. If you can't, we've got the worst. Mm. And Will I Am, funnily enough, he's talking about technology. He he's just donated. You know, he did a, a recent show. He donated a lot of money to new technology in in the UK and for kids to learn and in the states. He know that's exactly where he's put his money, teaching underprivileged kids the new technologies. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Mm. But it's not just about money, as you know. It's about it's about actually utilizing people. There are so many good people who have come up the hard way who would happily give their time if they if they but they need to be properly utilised. Mm. You know, we've all got to make a living. We've all got our own commitments. But at the same time, I'd happily give my time. I do, but it's never enough. Mm. You know, it's never enough. Well, hopefully, you know, that's it. And I think that's the the idea with the internet nowadays. And mm-hmm. you know, we can make this information accessible, and hopefully, we can put it in front of the right people. Yeah, and if you inspire children, that that one piece of inspiration they'll take away with them. Mm. They'll just take that away, and, and you've given them something. You've given them hope for the future. You know that inspiration's everything. If they look at you and say, "Well, he's had it tougher, tougher than I'm getting it," and look what he's done, why can't I do that? What, what, what's wrong with me? You know, I mean, that's the point. It's to actually a lot of these kids don't truly believe they're worthy of anything. They don't believe that, that they've got any future. And if you can give them that kind of inspiration, that kind of belief. The sky's become the limit, you know. Yeah, that's that's what it's all about. It really, really is. So what's your plans in the future? I mean, what you, you you've obviously learned a lot over the last years, but what, what what's your plans? What what do you wanna what do you wanna do? Um, I'm probably gonna write a um, we're talking about writing another book. Um and um this book's gonna be more about um more sort of to do with life coaching and to do with like, you know, um it's more to do with sort of bringing things up to date and how you know more personal training, that kind of thing. So I'm looking at writing another book. I just really, realistically would like to... We're talking to people about my biography becoming a, a TV movie. So that's there's talks going on about that at the moment. So, you know, just keep trucking on, really, to be quite honest with you. It's one of those things where I've never, I never plan. I just seem to <laughs> forge ahead. I don't seem to make plans. I just seem to become inspired and just drive at it you know I, I, I'm not one of those people that say in five years time I want to be there because I think you set yourself up for failure yeah but you, you're obviously very well driven I mean you know you're, you're driven you know what you want to do and you've probably got something in the back of your mind where you're making you know you're, you're, you're thinking about how there are lots happen. of yeah there are lots yeah. of business pro- uh, projects that are going on but like most things they obviously need the financial backing and everything there's there's I've been approached to do some phone app workouts for um you know for mobile phones and for you know for, for people downloading gyms and uh, a fitness uh, another fitness DVD and another book so you know and then obviously and what would you like what would you like uh, you know as the final question what would you like your legacy to be uh, that's a tough one really I would just really want my children to be proud of me I want my children to say you know he was a good guy you know he's somebody who they could somebody that I didn't have ever have anyone I could look, look up to as a child I just want my children to be able to say I could look up to you you know you, you know somebody I can aspire to be myself or somebody I you know I can look up to my father and say you know he's my role model because I didn't have that as a child well you're definitely an inspiration to many many people Paul thank you very much it was really really nice thank you nice talking to you thank you very thank much you. and thank you very much for watching Inspiring People all the best for more information go to www.thebestyou.co